Well, thank you all for coming out um, to our uh, discussion today. Um, uh, it's a, a great opportunity to develop this association with, with Dr. Edwards um, that now is uh, maturing into you know, a, a number of, of different collaborations. Um, and I've had the pleasure to get to know Jessica Luther here over the last um, couple years too. So this is a conversation that doesn't happen by itself, as we're all aware. Um, you know, subjects like this need to be forthrightly addressed, and so we're happy to um, help make this happen today. Um, I'd like to thank our Center for Women and Gender Studies here on campus for um, helping to make this event happen. Um, it's also supported by the Ann W. Richards Chair in uh, Sports and Media here at Moody College. So we're grateful for uh, all the support. Um, our uh, interrogators today are Jessica Luther, who's an Austin-based writer um, who got a master's degree here um, in 2004. She's um, become an unwitting sports journalist um, in the time since, and uh, she's, um, she's developed a uh, sport and domestic violence beat that is a little bit unparalleled out there, and it's a great opportunity to have her in Austin. Um, she is currently working on a new book that I think we expect out in the fall on sportsmanlike conduct, college football, and the politics of rape, um, which is going to be published by Akashic Books. Um, Dave Zirin is the editor of that book series. Um, uh, Dr. Edwards is Professor Emeritus of Sociology from the University of California. Um, he's been uh, on the bleeding edge of, of any number of, of issues related to sports and society um, over the years, certainly race and gender chief amongst them. Um, the two of them are um, well equipped to uh, guide this discussion, so I'll just let them start talking. Thank you very much. So this came out of Dr. Edwards was here in January for the Black Student Athlete Conference, and it was there that he first, I know, was it the first time? Well, I mean, you did the keynote speech, and it was very, it was all about sort of um, the need to talk more about uh, equality for black girls and women in sport and society. Um, and so part of what I am interested in today is I sort of would like to know why. Like, why is this now what you're interested in? How does someone come to this topic and suddenly get to the point where they want to be speaking out about it? Well, I've been interested in uh, the status of women in American society for a number of years. In 1984, uh, during the course of a speech, I forget at what school at this age, they all began to run together on me. But I made the statement that uh, ultimately, um, we have to be concerned about the status, circumstances, and outcomes of women and girls because we men and boys aren't going anywhere that women and girls don't go as full and equal and contributing partners, that we are not going to be everything that we can be until women and girls can be everything that they ought to be. As circumstances have continued to deteriorate in the African American community, uh, it has become even clearer to me that action, not just explanation, um, is imperative. Uh, we in the... In <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> we in the um, African American community are um, are <clears throat> are not going to um, are not going to be able to um, solve any of the problems that we have unless we uh, bring women into the fold. If we're talking about obesity, well, guess who buys the food? in most instances, cooks it, prepares it. 
Uh, if we're going to deal with um, education, well, guess who are most of the school teachers in the lower levels, especially in early childhood education? Guess who shops for the school supplies? Guess who uh, helps uh, with the homework? Guess who's down at the school when uh, issues come up? It's, it's, it's the women, typically because they're the ones who are there most consistently in a home. Medical uh, problems, Obamacare notwithstanding, uh, guess who's the first one to typically notice that somebody is ill? Guess who's the one who winds up taking them to the clinic or the hospital? Guess who's there to help rehab once they're released in terms of any particular medical condition? Um, even ex-offenders, um, uh, uh, the number of young black men going into and uh, coming back from prison to the community. When they come out, um, as I found when I was director of parks in Oakland for three years, they don't uh, go to their homie's house, they don't go to uh, their uh, 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 father's house, uh, strange father's house, they don't go uh, to uh, an uncle's house, they go to their mother's home, they return to their grandmother's home, they return to their sister's home, they return to a girlfriend's home. If we're gonna do anything serious about the rehab, of uh, ex-offenders so that we cut into the recidivism and the victimization of the community. We're gonna to have to bring women into the fold. So these kinds of realities, um, along with um, uh, the uh, startling statistics about the abuse of women um, um, in the African-American community brought a new urgency to this. Uh, when you look at statistics, uh, which indicate that the number one cause of death for African-American women ages 16 to 34 is homicide at the hands of the men in their lives. More, more than cancer, more than automobile accidents, something has to be done about this. When you look at uh, the uh, untested rape kits and so forth that impact the inner city as much as uh, the rest of the country, uh, where we have over 400,000 untested rape kits, uh, where we understand that only 10% of rapes are ever even reported. That's four million that are gone undealt with. We have to deal with that. So our very survival in the African-American community is dependent upon elevating the status, circumstances, and outcomes of women and girls. But that also applies to the nation. We live in a global society now. We cannot have over 50% of the population who are oppressed, repressed, stalked, beat, slapped, kicked, raped, and murdered, and expect to compete with the rest of the world in this technologically sophisticated age. So there's a new urgency to it, and I have spoken out about it in the past, going back to the 1980s, but now um, that, um, uh, uh, that that, that uh, uh, action that was advocated has now become absolutely urgent and imperative, especially in the African-American community, because that's the only hope for us to, uh, to advance and, and develop. You just answered like my first three questions, so that was great. Um, so when you gave this talk, it was at the Black Student Athlete Conference, and we're obviously here for sports and media, and I write on sports. Um, so when you look, when you say that we need uh, to create a necessary paradigm shift um, in order to elevate the status, circumstances, and outcome of black women and girls, um, where does sports fall in this? Well, <clears throat> sports are unique in a number of ways. Uh, one, it is the preeminent uh, stage for the expression of the modeling of uh, the setting the standards for masculinity in American society. You ask the average eight to 10 year old or 12 year old on the street, would they rather be President Barack Obama or LeBron James? No contest, they'd rather be LeBron James. Uh, so um, uh, the um, standard that is reflected there becomes critically important. And so when it comes down to athletes' um, uh, impact in terms of modeling, notwithstanding Charles Barkley's declaration that I'm not a role model. He may think that, but when he puts on that uniform, that modeling uh, uh, responsibility and obligation, uh, he puts that on as well. It comes with the uniform. It comes with the stage. And so athletes, male athletes, have to be um, aware of their obligations in that regard. And everything that they do is magnified, exploded, blown up, especially in this age of the social media, as a consequence. 
uh, during the, the, the week that Ray Rice knocked his fiancée out and estimated 40,000 other women were beaten in this country. So, uh, and they weren't, they weren't, you know, you don't hear the outcry, you don't hear the, so this is where the, 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 the impact comes. Uh, over the eight years of Roger Goodell's uh, tenure as um, commissioner, there have been uh, uh, 59 uh, cases of domestic violence, sexual assaults, so various cases of assault against women by players. Uh, society, and that's out of some 1,750 to 1,800 uh, players. Uh, society would love to have those kinds of uh, statistics. The reality is not uh, of, of the situation and the urgency of the situation uh, with regard to uh, athletes is not in the, in the numbers, it's in the image uh, because they set the standard for masculinity in so many, in so many instances. Uh, beyond that in sports, it becomes critically important that we understand that sports reflects the status and so forth of women in society. And so uh, in just uh, speaking to people over the last week uh, about who is in the final four for the women's uh, NC2A, nobody knew. And on top of it, nobody cared. Um, uh, the, uh, a few uh, women uh, understood that Connecticut was there. You know, they looked at Maryland and uh, they even had a couple of South Carolina uh, uh, fans there. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, it didn't get the publicity, it didn't get the notoriety, it didn't have the profile and so forth because they tend to measure women's basketball prowess against that of men. And so you get this sentiment, well, Lisa Leslie, yeah, she was a great basketball player, but she could never guard LeBron James in the paint. Well, uh, Floyd Mayweather is a tremendous boxer, but he, in his prime, he, he, and he, he, I mean, he could not stay in the ring two minutes uh, with Mike Tyson or, or with Muhammad Ali. It's a different division, but we don't say that Floyd Mayweather is not a great boxer. Um, uh, women's basketball has produced some tremendous athletes. I mean, going back to Cheryl Miller and that group, uh, but they don't get the credit because we have a tendency to discount and diminish women, and that's reflected, uh, that reflects what's going on in the society more generally. So sport has a phenomenal role to play in helping us to see clearly what the situation is we're dealing with and what the challenges are that we face. Also, what our responsibilities are, uh, given the image and the uh, power of the uh, athlete uh, in terms of uh, literally setting a standard for deportment, for disp di you know, dis masculine disposition and mystique and all the rest of that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to throw a hard one at you. So one of the things I'm really interested in, especially as I'm writing this book and thinking about my own responsibility as a journalist when I cover this topic, is focusing on individual athletes versus sort of the systems in which they work, right? And we're here talking about systemic stuff. And there's two things about sort of uh, the focus on the individual that makes me nervous about the conversation. And one of the things has to do with the fact that most of the time I end up writing on football, sometimes on basketball, because those are the two biggest sports. And so we talk about them a lot. Um, and they also happen to be played by a lot of black men. And so one of the things when we're focused on the individual athlete that I worry about as a journalist covering this is sort of continuing the narrative of the criminal black man, right? That I'm participating in that by focusing specifically on the athlete. And I'm wondering in that case sort of how do we have this conversation? Like if we're gonna talk about it in sports and we're gonna talk about it because we care so deeply about sport. Um, how do we make it so that it's productive and how do we do it so we're not just reifying these stereotypes? Um, how do we, I mean, is that possible? Can we actually do that? And then the other thing, um, when we focus on the individual is, um, anytime I don't, this is how I'll say it, anytime I don't focus on the individual, like if I want to talk about a coach or an AD or an athletic director or an owner, uh, people get really mad at me. Um, some of the worst comments I've ever gotten um, was a piece about Missouri where I suggested perhaps their athletic director um, 
should get in trouble for the amount of sort of issues of violence against women that had happened under him. Um, and, and in your piece that when you spoke and then you've also written something on this, you talk a lot about um, white supremacy and, you know, and sexism. Um, and so when I think about white <laughs> male supremacy, um, and I think like, what do, um, you know, what do athletic directors look like? Who are they, right? Who runs universities? Who's in charge of the NCAA right now? Who's, um, who are, what do the owners of the NFL teams look like, right? I was thinking about this a lot last night after Duke won, and on the stage were Emirat and um, Coach K, and together the two of them make like $8 million or something, you know, um, surrounded by a lot of black kids. And so when we focus, when we talk about it in sports, we end up focusing a lot then on these individual athletes and, you know, I'm never going to say we shouldn't sort of deal with the individual, but what ends up happening, I fear, sort of um, recreating these narratives of criminality and then around black men especially, and then at the same time, we're totally ignoring sort of the system under which they work, which is run basically by white men. So how do we do this? How do we have this conversation <clears throat> in sports and, and work in these, this minefield? Well, the you're faced in sport with the same problem that journalism is faced with overall in uh, covering issues and so forth in society. Um, stereotypes uh, tend to fill in where there's a lack of context. Uh, and uh, in writing in sports, uh, especially when it comes down to these issues that are rife with stereotype uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, characterizations, imagery, history, and so forth. It's always smart to start off first by creating the context. Uh, in journalism, more generally, we talk about issues all over the world, uh, but we never talk about them in context. Uh, and so we wind up with uh, uh, such um, idiotic uh, notions as uh, people uh, in the Middle East are against us because of, of who we are. Well, they're not against us because of who we are. They're against us because we have a history with people in the Middle East going back generations uh, that revolve around uh, the exploitation of their oil resources, drawing all kinds of boundaries uh, that were conducive to the interest of, uh, of Europe as opposed to conducive to the interest of the people uh, who were on the land, all kinds of history and context there which is not presented. Uh, so we wind up with these silly kinds of characterizations of the situation and then we try to explain the facts of uh, subsequent developments uh, without context. So within this situation with the black athletes, we have to begin by understanding that uh, you look at football at the collegiate level, you look at basketball at the collegiate level, you look at football and basketball at the pro level. Um, as a consequence of what's happening at the collegiate level, you find that they, when sports were uh, desegregated, uh, they desegregated the locker room. It was not about brotherhood, it was about business. And what they wanted was that untapped uh, pool of athletic talent. And once somebody went down that road, as uh, everybody from the Southeastern Conference to the Old Southwest Conference found out, you're not going to compete on a national scale unless you go down that road too, because somebody has got to be able to tackle an Earl Campbell. Uh, you know, so at, at, the, at the end of the day, they integrated those sports that were revenue producing. So to this day, whether it's Texas or whether it's Illinois or whether it's Ohio State, when you look at the proportion of African American athletes in football and basketball, it outstrips the proportion of students on campus. It most certainly outstrips the proportion of black athletes in water polo and diving and swimming and golf uh, and so forth. So once you understand how those athletes came to be in those positions, it becomes very, very clear uh, that anything that happens, whether it's good or bad, whether it's winning the Heisman Trophy and gaining 2,000 yards in a season or whether it's an attack on a woman on campus, if it involves an athlete, you up the chances substantially of that athlete coming out of the pool that they have uh, created out of the African-American community. And under circumstances where the preeminent factor 
in these situations uh, almost uh, inevitably is uh, whether or not this individual can help us athletically, whether he can help my football program, whether he can help my basketball program, uh, as opposed to whether he can pass the Mother Teresa character test and the Albert Einstein academic standard, uh, you're going to have individuals that you take risks with. And when you add to that, putting these athletes in an environment that they have absolutely no developed expertise in, in most cases, they don't have expertise in a middle, upper middle class uh, environment. They don't have expertise in a, uh, a high, uh, highly um, uh, organized uh, institutional uh, setting. Uh, they don't have expertise in a multiracial uh, environment where they inevitably are on the bottom, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the local community, whether it's with the local police force and so forth, uh, and yet they're expected to function in a way that where they stay out of trouble, where they do all the right things on campus, in the uh, athletic uh, sphere, and so forth. And when something goes wrong, it tends to be uh, uh, characterized without context. And in order to understand it, the people who read the stuff, who look at it, fall back on stereotypes, convention, uh, and so forth, and it's, oh, that's that, those black athletes again, uh, out of control, criminality, attacking women, and so forth. So the way that you deal with this kind of situation is to always uh, put everything within context. These are not excuses. This is context. To talk about how the Middle East came about and how those borders were arbitrarily drawn to suit the interest of European powers and so forth following World War I and most certainly uh, after World War II in 1954, for example, with the installation of the Shah in uh, um, Iran uh, uh, at the behest of the CIA and the United States government. And uh, th those, th that was not in the interest of the people of Iran. That was in the interest of the United States and Western powers. So when you, when you put things in context, uh, there still may be those who say, well, they're writing about uh, black athletes again. Well, then, that, then that's what you, well, I tell you what, uh, you go and find me a white boy in that program who's the leading scorer on the basketball team and rebound and the leading ground gainer in football and have him do something and I'll write about him. But in the meanwhile, I have to write about who has been brought in and who has crossed the line of acceptable behavior. Um, in terms of um, the athletic directors and, and so forth. That's context, right? Yeah, that's context, absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. You're going to do that context. That's you're going it, to do that right? context, and and you talk about when they come to campus and they're not necessarily prepped for sort of being here. So w then that sort of begs, you know, where does that responsibility lie then? Well, I think that that responsibility um, is spread out uh, in terms of just the abject realities of the situation. Any athletic department that brings, is responsible for bringing a young person onto a campus is responsible for that young person. I don't care whether you're a student, whether you're a student athlete or whatever, you essentially replace the parents. That is your responsibility. Uh, athletics have a particular responsibility in that regard for two reasons. One, as I stated, the, the image, uh, the, the footprint left by the athlete uh, in the course of, of matriculating and participating in sports. And secondly, uh, because of the high, the high profile uh, of uh, the athlete and how that redounds to the entire program. Um, to that extent, an athletic director, a coach, that does not fully, not just grasp, because most of them grasp what's at stake and the possibilities of the train leaving the track. But they've got to embrace the responsibility. And in many instances, they don't embrace the responsibility. They go and find somebody that they trust to come in, and all of a sudden, this individual becomes student advisor. Uh, and you look at the preparations and so forth, uh, oftentimes, aside from race, uh, there's very little connection with the athletes that, that is recruited. In many instances, they do not uh, uh, 
they're not in on the recruitment process. When the kid is first contacted, they don't know the, the, the kid's family. They don't understand the community that he came from. They don't know what his background is. They don't know whether he's been abused or beaten or whether his, uh, he had domestic violence in the family. They don't know any of that. They, the, the, the football team or the basketball team will go out and get a kid because, first of all, of his ability to help them win. And then when they get here, uh, after some, well, here's what we want you to be aware of with this kid. Here are some things here and so forth. That we'll, but, the, but the advisor, the one that is saddled with that duty, doesn't have the in-depth grasp and so forth of this student's circumstances to really help uh, keep, a, keep this person on track, help deal with him. So what you end up with um, is somebody who is trying to um, put out fires. Uh, they hear that the kid's not going to class, so they're on top of that. They hear that the kid had a brush with a lady in the cafeteria. They try to deal with that. They hear that he's falling out with his girlfriend. They try to deal with that. They hear that he's got three girlfriends and one of them might be pregnant. They try to deal with that. So after a period of time, uh, these counselors, despite their best efforts and despite their greatest uh, 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 and most noble intentions, end up functioning like fire marshals in a house full of pyromaniacs. And, and not only that, they not only have the responsibility of, of say, the revenue-producing sports, but in point of fact, they're responsible for athletic department, uh, department and citizenship and so forth. And also, they tend to be understaffed. If they have three or four people, a hey, they, they, are, they are the exceptional because most of the institutions that I know have one or two and then maybe a graduate assistant whose basic thing is to help them with their homework, if not flat out do their papers, uh, as we found out at the University of North Carolina. So uh, all of this um, is, is what we see rolling out when we see that piece on uh, a black athlete who's in trouble on a Division I traditionally white campus. That is what we're looking at. But you will never get that context in most instances uh, within uh, in the story. What you see is the black athlete and people say, okay, there they go again. Why don't, why don't they control those guys? Why, why don't they punish those guys severely and so forth, not understanding that punishment is never, absolutely never, a, an effective and dependable route to reform. Uh, it never is. Uh, this is why we haven't been able to police and incarcerate our way out of the issues and problems involving gangs uh, in our urban centers. Uh, punishment doesn't get that done. I was in prison. I tutored athletes, tutored um, um, uh, prisoners um, uh, at, uh, for San, uh, San Francisco County Jail at San Bruno for 10 years, worked with uh, our chaplain, who was the death row chaplain, uh, the 49ers chaplain who was the death row chaplain at San Quentin, and I've worked with programs inside of San Quentin for 13 years, and I know of absolutely no instance, none, not one, in all those years where punishment has resulted in reform. It results in anger, it results in confusion, it results in dispositions and attitudes of revenge. And while you might constrain him over here, all of a sudden it breaks out with his girlfriend. Well, why did he turn on her like that? I, they, they've been together for three. Well, look, look at what's happening over here. They got him bent into a pretzel to make sure that, you know, he gets it done in, in football in the athletic department and the kid is angry, frustrated, doesn't understand, and so forth. So all of this is what we're, what we're trying to work with. All of this is what we have to understand and grasp. So um, when you're talking fire marshal and your, um, all the fires are putting out. Uh, one of the things I think a lot about is sort of exactly that about punishment and sort of reacting versus preventing. Um, and I think this ties into um, what you talked about earlier with the idea of masculinity being really important. And so one of the things that when we have this discussion about you know, violence against women and um, we need a new definition of masculinity, right? We need new role models for that. Um, and I'm pretty cynical about this kind of thing. Um, how do we do it? Like, I just can't imagine sort of what would that look like to have a different masculinity in sport? I mean, how do we, how do we, we need to start there, right? If we can agree that sort of sports is the way that we, one of the primary ways we sort of inscribe masculinity in this culture. Um, 
we need, sorry, goodness, we need to start there. But what would that, how does that work? How do you change that inside the locker room? And again, I'm, I'm going to push on this, but, you know, I think about coaches. Um, I'm cynical about, you know, the very people that come up in the system being the ones that are going to change the system. And so is it the athletic director that needs to put rules in place? Like, how do we do that preventative work to change the masculinity? How, how do we do it? Well, uh, I think, first of all, coaches are not going to change the system. Athletic directors are not going to change the system. If we've learned anything from history is that uh, fundamental basic change, cultural change in particular, does not come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. I mean, Benazir Bhutto, as uh, prime minister of Pakistan, didn't change at all. The fact that here we are some 30 years later uh, and a young lady is shot in the head because she wants an education. Um, right. Indira Gandhi didn't change India at all, still has uh, outlandish rape uh, uh, records and so forth as so far as women case, are concerned. Who's the bottom then when well, you're imagining that? Well, it's all of us. Okay. It's all of us. And we cannot afford to become cynical for the very simple fact that there's so much at stake. Uh, and the first part of this is understanding that a great deal of what passes for mac masculinity is actually uh, what is uh, 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 anti-femininity. Uh, and so it is not so much that it is a um, masculine uh, uh, dimension, but that it is not a feminine dimension, and therefore you can play it off as being uh, masculine. Um, and we have to begin uh, this process not by attacking masculinity, but by elevating the status, circumstances, and outcomes of women and girls. In other words, uh, uh, upgrading the definitions of femininity. Um, the the uh, notion uh, that a woman is principally foremost, in some instances, defined by what she looks like, uh, not by her character, competence, capability, her courage, her ability to uh, to get things done and to contribute, but by what she looks like. Um, uh, that is a dimension of, um, of uh, masculine predisposition that uh, we have to begin to jettison. Uh, we have to uh, start uh, by some of the demeaning things that we say. Uh, I mean, it starts at that level. Uh, uh, you know, to, to tell a young boy, you, you throw like a girl, uh, you run like a girl, uh, you were playing basketball and you, you let that other kid put a dress on you. I mean, that, that those kinds of comments, why in order uh, to uh, empower our sons do we have to diminish and demean our daughters? Uh, we have to get away from that. Uh, in some instances, women have to step up. I am all for um, uh, women uh, having beauty contests and one thing or another, but what about women who have uh, intellectual contests? What about women in engineering schools, in law schools, sitting on the United States Supreme Court, running for president, and so forth? Uh, they should have not just a co-equal status, but because it's more substantive. Uh, it's about the content of their character and, and, and the, the caliber of their competence. Uh, that that it, it should have uh, uh, superior status. Those are the kinds of changes that have to be made. And in some instances, um, women have to lead in that. You have to insist on things. Uh, men uh, cannot lead women to anything. We are, we are so embedded culturally in this male chauvinistic swinishness where we look at women through eyes that are so jaundiced uh, in terms of sexual conquest, in terms of uh, standards of uh, beauty that have been imposed and so forth, that we can't see women clearly. We simply can't. And so what I have advocated is that women take the lead in this. Begin to insist uh, among yourselves, because a lot of this is not just perpetuated by men. We have to be honest about this. A lot of it is perpetuated by women against each other. Uh, some of the cattiness, some of the other stuff that goes on, uh, we have to be bigger than that. And men have to be in a position to partner with women in terms of taking care of business on our side of the fence, 
to make sure that women have the space and the time and the latitude to begin uh, to uh, grow, expand, uh, and so forth in terms of their definitions of themselves. It is not just men who have been brainwashed. A lot of women have been brainwashed. So uh, this problem is so um, critical, uh, not just uh, a noble sentiment, uh, equal protection, and so forth. It's critical uh, to, the, to, to the life, to the development, to the evolution of uh, us as a people and as a nation uh, here in this country. And it will not happen from the top. Um, we have to remember Trayvon Martin, um, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Oscar Grant, all occurred on Barack Obama's watch. Didn't change a thing. The only thing that changed was now we have the technology to catch it all on camera in many instances. And so uh, when we uh, look at these problems, we have the potential to resolve them. But the first step in that is having uh, the faith, the courage, the commitment to begin the process. At this point, to be perfectly honest with you, we do not have the words. We talk about having an honest conversation about race. Uh, most families in this society don't have an honest conversation in the family. Black people do because it's a survival imperative that you have that conversation with each other, with your kids, with your sons in particular. But in most white families, they don't have that conversation. They don't wake up thinking about it. They don't wake up talking about it any more than I woke up this morning wondering how uh, the average uh, Pakistani American family was doing. We didn't have that conversation this morning. It's not that I have anything against Pakistani Americans. It's just that, hey, it, it just never crossed my mind to have that conversation. And so as a consequence, it's not an issue of just having an honest conversation across the racial barriers about race. It's about having the language and the words that are in common uh, convention uh, among the races to have that conversation. At this point, we do not even have the words to have an honest conversation about gender and sexism and misogyny and so forth in this country other than to condemn uh, the uh, damage once it's done. We, we, we don't have the language. And, and, and women, I think, are in the best position to create that language, uh, to generate that language. And so uh, this is... Um, uh, a struggle. That's why it's called a struggle rather than a picnic. It's hard. It's something that we have to get, we have to get, we have to uh, uh, work on and men have to be prepared to allow women to lead that effort. We have to trust women to lead that effort in their own elevation and so forth and then we have to put ourselves in a position to be willing to partner with them and clean up the garbage on our side of the fence. That's the only way we're going to move forward and eventually remove the barriers altogether. So how can sport help us do that? Well, I think we can start by understanding uh, that women's sports deserve to be supported, that there are a separate division, that there are some great athletes there, and it's not just during the Olympics when they go and bring in medals. How do, I mean, I was women, just, there was like, I um, just retweeted this sports center had a tweet about UConn and Notre Dame tonight, and the replies are, Horrible, but oh, this absolutely. is true every single time Sports Center yeah. says anything about women's basketball. Yeah. Like yeah. people just lose their minds yeah. to get in that sexist comment. Um, so I just think, like, what? I mean, what will it take for that not to happen all the time? Like, I just, I can't see it. I mean, I'm working towards well, it, and I'm, and I'm on the journey there. But I sort of, anyway. Don't um, ever be surprised um, when. Uh, you get the expected uh, in terms of these kinds of uh, in terms of these kinds of issues. Um, when you look at, f first of all, I think women have to start supporting women's sports because when you look at the stands at a women's basketball game on a campus where the majority of the students, 55, 56 percent, are women, and the stands are empty. For the women's basketball game, that's not just a problem in terms of women's basketball. That's a problem in terms of orientation, disposition, and so forth of, um, 
of, of those women who they don't understand the centrality of this whole process, that that's part of the battle and the struggle that they're fighting to be seen as something other than the cheerleader and the campus football queen. Um, so that part has to change. The other part that has to change is that women have to begin to insist that there be equitable framing and so forth of women's uh, sports. And the way you do that is not to uh, write letters of complaint to ESPN. You write letters of complaint to uh, General Motors, who uh, uh, is a sponsor of, uh, of, uh, of the programs that come on ESPN. You, you write letters of complaint to the uh, Kellogg Corporation. You write letters of complaint to uh, Standard Oil and so forth and so on. And at some point, they will begin to get the message. And that is how change comes about. Power never, ever concedes anything without a struggle. Um, it, it is a privilege, uh, will um, never concede anything uh, without a struggle. And uh, women have to take the lead in uh, uh, that, that effort. And, and, and those men who are enlightened and informed and committed have to step up to the plate and partner with women in that effort. So um, it, it, it's not going to change because it's the right thing to do. Nothing ever changes because it's morally right. It doesn't change until there is uh, a benefit that outstrips the cost of not changing. Um, the, the, the desegregation of locker rooms, as I stated, didn't come about as a consequence of brotherhood. It came about after World War II and a manpower shortage and this untapped pool of black athletic talent out there. And uh, Branch Rickey looked around and said, this is insane. We're talking about pitchers who lost an arm in a war and we have all of this talent out here that we could plug into. Women have to be able to create a situation where uh, the society and men in particular are willing to transcend their misogyny and sexism in order to uh, get the transaction done. And that means organization, that means commitment, and that means women, first of all, beginning to talk to other women. It's not going to change because it's the right thing to do, or even because there's a heck of a lot at stake. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, Greg Howard had a post today at Deadspin about Ray Rice, which is sort of this, you know, seminal moment in the discussion is, um, you know, the initial video in February and then, of course, the full video is released in September. And Greg argues at Deadspin today that sort of the reason that Ray Rice is not signed to a team today is um, because he happened to hit her on videotape when he hadn't had a good season. And that, you know, he sort of argues like, well, if he was really producing on the field up until that moment, then we'd see him signed. Um, because there's so much invested, you know, like looking at the Hardy case and sort of, you know, a judge has convicted him and there's the technicalities of that getting thrown out, but like, you know, the evidence is pretty overwhelming. We'll see what the NFL ends up doing. But, um, you know, the Cowboys had no issue sort of signing him on, right? And, and so, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, going after brands, but I, I, I do think a lot about there's so much money Right? And I, we are sitting at a school with an incredible amount of money, uh, famously so invested in, or that they get out of their sports program. Um, what do we do about the money? I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying about, like, it's not going to be easy. This is going to be a struggle. And I feel like number one is the massive amounts of money that are invested in these people. Um, we're willing to totally overlook. I mean, that's Greg's entire point today was like, we would totally overlook what he did, or teams would, and then we'd all go along with it if, if we felt like he was going to get on the field and run eight yards every time that he got the ball right. Well, I think, first of all, you, you want to be intelligent and strategic about the fights that you pick. Um, I think it's a travesty that Ray Rice is the poster child for domestic violence. Uh, in this country today. Um, the uh, domestic violence problem in America today is as bad as in any society on the face of this earth. In 2011, there were 943 honor killings reported uh, for the record in Pakistan. 
that same year there was 1,095 women killed by their spouses here in this country. Uh, and you couldn't put a razor blade between the motivations in terms of the honor killings and the reasons that these women were killed here by their spouses. Um, that um, uh, is what we are faced with. Uh, a woman who is pregnant has uh, three to four times uh, the chance of showing up in emergency as a result of being beaten as a result of, as, as a result of maternity reasons. Uh, we, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking at. And when you put that together with the fact that the average woman who reports being beaten has been beaten on the average 17 times before she reports it, uh, that uh, gives you some idea of the scale of problem that we have here. But in focusing on Ray Rice, it enables us uh, to ride the whole problem out of town. And he's not on the football field, and therefore we've had an impact on this issue. Um, I don't think that Ray Rice should be on the football field because he can't play anymore. You know, I, you forget about the, the rest of it. Uh, he, he, when you average two and a half yards of carry, you know what, uh, and, and you're 29, 30 years old, it may be time to start looking at, you know, hanging up the hanging up the pads. Uh, so so I'm, I'm not concerned about him being on the field or not being on the field. I'm concerned about this, this problem, this issue. And I'm concerned not just about what the uh, commissioner did initially and how he had to turn around and retrace his steps and everything. I'm concerned about the judge that did nothing. I'm concerned about the judge in the light of the video who did nothing. Uh, I'm concerned about the athletes who didn't stand up and say that if you're beating on a woman, I don't want you in my locker room, I don't want you on my team, I don't want you on the field, I don't want you uh, in, uh, in, in my, uh, to see you on game day, uh, I want you out of here because that is one that I absolutely refuse to tolerate and live with. And if the organization can't see that that is an absolute necessity, that in the, in the spotlight that we're in, we have an obligation, irrespective of what the courts do, to make sure that if you are beating on a woman, and this is not a thing of was he convicted or that, they got to have the film. You are out of here. You have forfeited your privilege to play this game. Um, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking at. Forget the football. Forget whether he gains eight yards of carry or two yards of carry. That's what we're looking at. If you have a guy that's convicted, what, the, what is the league going to do? What is the commissioner going to do? What are the other players going to do? The ones who have wives, who have daughters, who's, who, who, who are going to have to be looking at this guy? Um, so th this, is, this is where the struggle has to take place. It's not that Ray Rice is a football player. Forget the football. He's a, a man that uh, had degenerated to the point that he would hit a woman. And, and you know, I've, I've told guys at the, at the 49ers, you can't win that one. When you put your hands on a woman, you, you, you're done. And uh, one of the uh, players said, well, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Edwards, uh, I was at a club the other night, and a lady uh, threw her drink in a guy's face and, 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 and he teed off and hit her. He wasn't a football player, but I can, I can understand why he did it. I said, well, how's he going to win that one? What is she going to do, come back and hit him? She can't win that one, which means that when he hits her, he can't win that one. Well, well what would you do if, 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 if you were in a club and a woman uh, threw a drink in your face? I said, I would look right over at the bartender. I said, bartender, this beautiful lady here just spilled her drink. Uh, could you give me one of what she's drinking and make her as a double? And I would wolf that down and get out of there so fast uh, that um, um, uh, I'd have a case of... Uh, the bins by the time I got to the parking lot. Uh, you have to manage these situations. They're never going to go smoothly. You're going to get into disputes and fracases and so forth with women and other men and so forth. You would think as adults that would begin to lessen because we're not talking about sandbox relationships here. But it happens. But men have an obligation to understand that you simply cannot go around beating on, humiliating, Women. It, it, everybody has a camera, if, if for no other reason, you know. Uh, uh, but women have to begin to insist on uh, on uh, on on uh, 
the fighting the main struggle. I, I wouldn't be concerned about uh, t t Ray Rice can't play anymore. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't be concerned about whether he's on the field. I'd be concerned about how can he be on the field having done this and what do the other athletes think about it. That's what I would be concerned about. You know, on top of that, I want to I want to push on this because watching the Ravens as an organization respond to what happened in February um, was difficult, and we now know you know Janae Rice has gone on the record um, with ESPN, and she's talked about this um, sort of that that press conference, the joint press conference that they did, and the Ravens. She has said they dispute this that you know they insisted on it. They had that terrible tweet that they put out into the world about how she's sorry for her role in it. Um, and I look at the, and, and so this to me is why I was asking about the money. I mean, people that don't want to think this is a problem, and they're, they don't, right? They, they want to err in that direction. Um, look at that, and they say, well, you know, she apologized. You know, she got on that stage with him. Um, and the Ravens, you know, they had a real financial investment in making that moment happen until, of course, the, the rest of the video came out and they ditched him as quickly as they could. Um, so, the, I mean, it, it would be great, I agree, if other athletes would stand up and say something. Um, I don't, I'm a huge fan of um, athlete activists. But at the same time, you know, when I look at the power that like an organization has to control that narrative and to put out incredibly damaging things that make it really hard then for someone like me to come along and write about this in context. Um, it's going to be hard. And, and the other, the other uh, thing that, um, uh, that, that, that I would say is that, uh, again, uh, let's, let's keep this whole thing in perspective. Uh, the Ravens are simply another large-scale institution. Uh, the president of a bank uh, beats on his wife. He doesn't lose his job. And most people in the business don't even know about it, even though the rumor may be circulating. He doesn't lose his job. You got a judge that was beating on his wife at the same time the Ray Rice thing came down. He, he's sitting on the bench judging people, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, and uh, uh, police officers don't lose their job. Uh, and they have some of the highest domestic violence rates of, of any profession because they tend to bring the job home from time to time. Uh, you have uh, uh, people uh, in school teaching who, who get involved in these kinds of, uh, in these kinds of situations. So at the, at the end of it all, um, uh, the, the, what you see in sport is, is uh, a recapitulation of what's in society and how it is handled tends to be a recapitulation of how it is handled uh, in society. Um, uh, O.J. Simpson out of uh, football for years and uh, he's beaten on Nicole Brown Simpson and the police come out and, uh, uh, the, you know, O.J. essentially tells them everything is okay, they leave and he's not in jail and anyth or anything else. Well, here we are 30 years later and, and uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with the same because nothing has changed in the basic fabric of, um, of um, uh, gender uh, relationships, particularly when it comes to sexism, misogyny, the value of women, and so forth and so on. Um, we tend not to believe women when they uh, say these things. And, and you get a situation like the Rolling Stone case at the University of Virginia, and people say, see there, I told you so. Look at that, I told you so. But it doesn't change the fact that there are 400,000 untested rape kits sitting up in this country. Uh, that the Congress doesn't care enough to put enough money in there to, uh, to, to get that taken care of, which means that probably some serial rapist has been running them up for years, uh, principally because nobody has cared enough uh, to, to track him down through these rape kits. So don't tell me anything about the University of Virginia and the Rolling Stone article. Uh, I understand that. I understand that you get people with all kinds of issues and problems and so forth. Some of them might even be psychosociopathic liars, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm sitting there looking at 400,000 untested rape kits. Uh, so uh, it's easy to uh, move to a space where you can point to something and say, see, this isn't as big a problem as we think it is, is being blown up and blown out of perspective and especially when it is in the interest of uh, profit and money and organizational uh, 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 viability to just sweep it all under the rug. Uh, 
we are entering a space, even in collegiate athletics, um, where these organizations, these programs, are too big and too profitable to derail. Too big to derail. And so you end up with travesties like Penn State. You end up with other kinds of developments. Uh, and that is going to become more and more the potential to cover this thing up because the money is so big, where you have tens of millions of dollars at stake for a national championship or making it to the Final Four or winning a Heisman Trophy uh, in your program. So um, we, th that, that makes it hard. There's absolutely no question that that makes it hard. But I think that uh, women uh, committed to changing this situation and men committed to partnering with, partnering with them in that effort uh, can change it. Every situation looks impossible until it's changed when you look at situations of this magnitude. So if the President of the United States can set as his post White House uh, agenda a um, my brother's keeper program calculated, strategically positioned and funded and so forth to help save at-risk young men, particularly in urban centers and so forth, then why, should, why can we not have a national program uh, focused on my sister's partner to go along with my brother's keeper so that we can bring those two things together and begin to cut into this uh, misogynistic uh, madness? Uh, because we, we have, our brothers are being kept better now than they've ever been. They just call it uh, San Quentin State Prison. They're kept 24 seven. We, we, we need to, we need to, we need to develop um, as a people, as a society, um, uh, and this is across the board, not just African American youth, uh, but American youth. Uh, 82 schools under investigation, uh, for their handling of sexual assaults oh, on campus. Over it's up over 100 now because every time, from, from what I understood, uh, when, when I first started looking at it, there were uh, 62. And then every time I talked to somebody, I said, well, they go into the investigation and say, well, how did you all handle this? Well, we handled it the same way that they handled theirs. Then they go and look at them and find out that they got a bunch of cases. Then they well, how did, why'd you, well, we model ours after theirs. And so the thing just kept escalating. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it was very women-led. Yeah, I mean, there's that absolutely. There's a documentary called The Hunting Ground that yeah. focuses on these young women who have yeah. sort of led that Title IX. Yeah, so, and you, uh, uh, part of the definition of being a man has to be a willingness to trust women and to partner with women in dealing with this uh, misogynistic swinishness that is built into the very foundations of American culture from the day that the founding fathers uh, essentially uh, erased uh, the personhood of women uh, by uh, restricting uh, citizenship to whites but uh, voting to white men. And everybody else is classified as other persons. Women are not mentioned at all and they're essentially assumed to be uh, the charges of their fathers and their family of origin, the property of their husbands uh, once they're married down to and including taking his surname much the same as slaves were property of slave masters and so you had Harry the property of Edwards uh, and uh, that was how this was uh, set up and that is where it is rooted. We have a tremendous amount of work to do and we're not going to be able to compete in a globalized world unless we have every hand on an oar and we cannot continue to keep women suppressed, women and girls suppressed and in a hole unless we sit right there in that hole with them to keep them there. Uh, and so uh, that partnering effort, my sister's partner, is every bit as important as my brother's keeper. In point of fact, in some sectors of society, such as African American traditional communities, it is more important because that's who's in the home, that's who's in the church, that's who's dealing with the schools, that's who's preparing and selecting the food, that's who's there when people get sick, come home from the hospital or the clinic and need 
rehab and somebody to be there to help. It's the women who are there. So we have to begin to deal with this as a reality. Is it difficult? Absolutely. As I stated, this is why they call it a struggle rather than a picnic. But because it's difficult, because there are so many odds that appear to be against us, when you have no option, the odds don't matter. Uh, and uh, that's where we are. Uh, and as is usual, when some, there's something systematically wrong, institutionally out of whack, in the nominally integrated society, it typically happens to the integrated minority first and worst, but it is only indicative of what is happening in the society more generally, and that is what we're dealing with. We do, are, are we going to do yeah, Q&A? Yeah, sure. I mean, you want to open it up? Oh, I have, no, I have absolutely no problem with anything. Anyone? If anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be more than happy to respond. He for she, Emma Watson, the actress, she stood in front of the UN and sort of introduced a he for she, which is, I th you know, sort of saying men need to step up and. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I am, no one person has the whole answer. We all have the capability and potential of coming up with a piece of the answer. And so anything uh, that helps move the ball up the field. I am totally uh, in support of. And, and I've been around long enough to know that a lot of times ideas that appear to be way out there, that appear to be, geez, that's just pipe dreaming or that's just somebody on a trip, all of a sudden somebody else sees a little piece of that and says, hey, you know what? I can understand where this may be falling short, but what happened right here at the core? I think we can build something on that. So anything, anybody who steps up and tries to get a handle on this problem, I don't care how large they think they, uh, how large a piece of the answer they have, they think they have, or how small a piece of the answer they think they have, we need to be supportive of that because the one thing that is absolutely certain is that no one has the whole answer. And when you come across somebody who tries to tell you that they have the whole answer, that's the first person that you want to get away from. Because what you're talking about at that point uh, is not uh, uh, an analysis and thinking and uh, hard-headed uh, 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 surveys of the situation and so forth. What you're looking at there um, is, uh, is propaganda and uh, probably dogma. So we, we, we simply need to... Uh, be supportive, applaud, especially if it's a woman that's stepping up and saying, hey, I think I have a piece of the answer here. Absolutely, my sister, tell me what I need to do to partner with you on that. Um, just going back to Jessica's point about alternative models of masculinity in the, in the public domain, I wonder if maybe Jessica and, you, and yourself, Harry, could speak to the potential impact to otherwise of Michael Sam and Jason Collins in particular, because there you clearly have two models of an alternative form of black masculinity that was very, that was very popularized, although if you actually look at where they are now, uh, maybe that also tells you something about maybe the, the limited impact. So maybe you could speak to, to that issue of the type of work when Michael Sam is kissing his partner live on ESPN, or when Jason Collins has that famous Sports Illustrated um, front cover. And also related to that, um, what do you think about someone like Richard Sherman? Uh, he did a, an essay recently in Sports Illustrated mm -hmm. um, in which he talks about the importance of him being a good father and offering that as a role model to his son and to other, and to other black men mm -hmm. as a way to engage in a certain type of black politics. Of course, that then leaks into a certain politics of respectability. So in other words, if you become a good family man, um, then that's one way in which we can deal with these issues of discrimination violence against black men, etc., which I just don't think is true. So um, could, could you maybe speak to the Michael Sam Collins uh, forms of representation 
and what he thinks of what he's doing. Sure, I actually just have the honor of interviewing Jason Collins because he was in town and um, there's a new documentary that's coming out about out athletes um, that he's a part of. And one of the people I interviewed um, for that piece was Wade Davis, who is, I think, the executive director of You Can Play, which is an organization that's helping to um, rid sport of homophobia. And Wade could speak to this so much better than I can, but he's very persuasive in the way he talks about how um, the work of ending homophobia in sport is directly tied to ending sexism in sports. Um, and that when you're working on those two things together, because they're both rooted in a specific type of masculinity that we might call toxic or something like that, um, that that work together is, is changing stuff. And so Wade, um, when I was interviewing him, I was sort of asking about Michael, this Michael Sam thing, because Sam is in this documentary, and I was like, well, he didn't make it onto the field, what, you know, does it matter? And um, Wade was insistent that just the little bit, just that tiny piece of Michael Sam kissing his boyfriend during the NFL draft, that one moment um, where people that showed up to watch fo something with football witnessed that, like, that that, that does matter rippling out. and. Um, I'm going to trust him because he's in there doing that. And I think, um, I mean, I think what Jason Collins did, I think his SI piece was wonderful, the way that he wrote it, bringing in, you know, religion and, and talking very openly about um, all those aspects. I think, I think that is an important part of moving forward because of all of that stuff tied to, it's all tied together. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, let me... Um Say, say a few things. Um, first of all, the, it's striking that in this era, uh, of all of, with all of the pressure for gay athletes to come out and so forth and so on, all of the ones who've come out have been black. Yeah. Um, they, they've been black. Uh, Sam's, Jason Collins, uh, Mike Sam, Jason Collins, Brittany Griner, um, most certainly Wade, uh, the, the young brother at, uh, uh, was it Marquette, I believe, a uh, college basketball player who came out. Yeah. UMass, UMass, right, at Amherst. Um, they've all been black. And the fundamental reason for this is that in this period, when you have Oscar Grant and Mike Brown and Eric Garner and Trayvon Martin and uh, Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old in Milwaukee, being shot down. Their second uh, issue is their gayness. They're, they're not going to be followed in the store because they're gay. They're not going to be pulled over by a cop and threatened because they're gay. Uh, they're not going to be denied uh, a rental apartment because they're gay. They're going to be denied those things because they're black unless somebody knows their sexual history. And on a first-time basis, that's unlikely to be the case. If, if, uh, if um, Mike Sam walked up and wanted to rent an apartment in a certain area uh, in the Bay Area, uh, they would know that he was gay if it, wasn't, if it was anybody but Mike Sam. They would, they would refuse to rent him the apartment, the apartment because he's black. And so it's a second-level second of, of concern and issue. Um, one has to raise the question of why you don't have white gay players coming out. And I've been around NFL for 30 years, and believe me, there are white gay players in the NFL. Why aren't they, why aren't they coming out? Second question I would raise is why is it that when Mike Sam and Jason Collins comes out, there are all these headlines, they're on Sports Illustrated, they're on all of the... But when Brittany Griner comes out, it's two months before anybody even acknowledges that she had come out. Uh, and uh, uh, because the uh, homosexual status of women has never really resonated at the same level as homosexuality among men. And the reason is uh, very clear. I mean, if you look at, um, in 1983, I did a survey of uh, men's magazines. Uh, and just looking at the pictures, 63% of the pictures in the magazines that I looked at, Hustler, Playboy, Penthouse, uh, Bronze Thrills, so forth, 63% of the pictures involved at least two women. These are men's magazines. We don't have a problem with homosexuality. We have a problem with women. 
And over the years that I was in uh, counseling and in prison and the years that I've counseled in San Quentin, uh, in the mid-1980s, the gay movement began to press for gay inmates being put on separate tiers because they were being raped and beaten and so forth and so on. So they put them on separate tiers. That made sex a, a marketable commodity within the prison. They changed in exchange for protection, in exchange for concessions, in exchange for all kinds of things. It made sex a marketable commodity because the gay inmates were on a separate tier. And, but the men did, involved did not consider themselves to be homosexual unless they were on the receiving end of the sexual relationship. Uh, the, 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 the men who were on the receiving end were called toss-ups and strawberries and in order to demonstrate that, quote, they belong to somebody, don't mess with them, reasons of protections and so forth, they began to walk around prison with the tops of their shorts showing. Swag, what came ultimately to be swagged pants because when they came out of prison, they had the same enemies that they had in prison and having their pants swagged meant, sent a message to their potential enemies that, hey, I'm still protected. You do something to me, something will happen to your folks in prison because I'm still protected. And so the young guys who didn't know anything about that history saw these people walking around with their pants swagged, and they've been in the big house, they've been in prison, they went down for attempted murder, and so forth. They thought, well, these guys are bad. These are some bad dudes. And then the video industry picked it up, the hip-hop industry picked it up, and they began to swag their pants. Uh, and the next thing you know, you have this whole tradition of swagged pants going on, but it came down to that division within prison. Just, just as prison culture has hijacked so much of our urban center culture as a result of this uh, insane incarceration policy that we have in this country, particularly when it comes to well, African Americans. And that is why it started with African Americans, the incarceration problem. The swagged pants didn't happen in the suburbs first. It didn't happen uh, in the upper classes. It happened in our urban centers, particularly with the African-American population. So they did not consider themselves to be gay unless they were on the receiving end. And they had to deal with all of the humiliation and uh, denigration and so forth that came as a consequence of that. What I'm saying is, we do not have a problem with homosexuality in American society. If that were the case, then what are all of these pictures doing of women together in these men's magazines? Uh, we, uh, the, uh, our first black Miss America was caught on camera with another woman where a guy was taking picture to, pictures to sell to men's magazines and eventually sold the pictures to Penthouse. We don't have a problem with homosexuality. In American society, we have a problem with women. And if we dealt with our problem with women, our problem with homosexuality would go away because men do not have a problem with homosexuality. We have a problem with women. They don't want to be put in a woman's role, and this is the great fear. If, if this guy is um, gay and is somebody's wife, I resent him for that because he uh, is in that feminine role. Uh, if he is in a male role and in a homosexual relationship, I resent him and fear him because he might try to put me in the female role because his role is the masculine role. Either way it rolls out, men wind up despising men who are in gay uh, relationships. Uh, either because of a fear that he might be looking at me in the shower thinking that I'm going to be his lady or because he has taken the lady's role and therefore he deserves all the denigration and so forth that I really feel deep down inside for women more generally. Um, the incident of kissing his partner during the course of the draft, there were ripples from it, all right. And one of the ripples was that it made clear to other athletes what role Michael Sam was in in that relationship as far as they could tell, and therefore this fear. 
of is he looking at me when I go in the shower? Does he think that he's going to be able to get me bent over and this kind of stuff? And that is the thinking that was in. So there were ripples that came from it. But again, our problem, our fundamental root problem, is not with homosexuality in American society. Our fundamental root problem is with women. We have got to get over this sexist, misogynistic, degenerate madness. Uh, and I think that what we will find is that our concerns and issues with homosexuality will begin uh, to evaporate like the morning mist before the rising sun. Uh, probably said too much already. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out and listening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you.